Hello everyone. This is the presentation of the talk's paper titled MOI, Multiplication Operated Encryption with Trojan Resilience. It's a joint work between Olivier Bronchin, Sébastien Faust, Virginie Lallemand, Gregor Leander, Léo Perrin, which also happens to be me, and François-Xavier Standard. Cryptographic primitives are not the only one. Many, many of the modern uh, operations that we rely on are um, implemented using integrated circuits. These are at the heart of all electronic hardware. These are then manufactured in cutting edge foundries, but these are extremely expensive. Extremely expensive. We are talking about billions of dollars. So that most nations do not have any. As a consequence, production is outsourced. So the way it works is that you have the designers of the integrated circuits, which uh, can be any company in the world, that will design uh, their uh, specific circuit that they need, send the specification of these to uh, the one of these foundries, and in return get the physical uh, circuits that they need. More than 90% of all integrated circuits are produced by only 13 foundries, so saying that there is some concentration here would be an understatement. Can we mitigate the security risks associated to this concentration at the primitive level? That's the question uh, I'm going to try to answer in this talk. First, I'm going to introduce what security risks I'm even talking about, as well as our general approach to solving uh, this problem. Then I'm going to introduce our solution, MOI, uh, giving it specification. Then I will give a bit more details about the cryptographic properties of the components of MOI and why um, we chose those. And then, uh, of course, give a first security, a quick security analysis of the cipher itself. So, why do we care, to put it simply? Uh, why is it pos potentially a problem that uh, we outsource the production of these integrated uh, circuits? There are several risks that are associated to this. Uh, counterfeiting is one of them. Uh, the um, design of the circuit could be reverse engineered to steal some uh, intellectual property. And there could also be some malicious modifications of the circuit. And we're going to focus on uh, the third one here. It corresponds to what we call hardware trojans. So it's, it means that um, if someone embeds a hardware trojan in an integrated circuit for a while, it's going to behave normally, but then there's going to be some trigger and that will cause this uh, circuit to uh, get some uh, damage, either in a physical or in a logical way. So what do we mean by triggers? It could be a physical trigger, like uh, some temperature uh, that changes. It could be a specific input. There is a special uh, keyword that you send to the uh, integrated circuit and it changes its behavior. Or it could be just a counter. So after, I don't know, 110, exactly 110 uh, calls to the integrated circuits, it starts misbehaving. And what do we talk about uh, damage or misbehavior? It could simply be that it stops working or that it starts revealing secrets uh, via some subliminal channel or some specific outputs. Of course, um, neither are uh, desirable as designers, and we then need to implement some countermeasures uh, so that even if there is such a hardware trojan, we can mitigate uh, what it can do. So obviously we can try to detect them so we can just try to spot the presence of a hardware trojan in an uh, integrated circuit before putting it in our product. We can use some logic testing, we can do some side channel analysis, sorry. We can do some uh, optical inspection of the device using uh, special uh, microscopes. We can also try to prevent uh, their insertion or their explo exploitation using split manufacturing, input scrambling. But the problem we have is that none of these methods is foolproof and furthermore, that all of them are very expensive and time-consuming. In this context, in uh, 2016, there was a paper that was accepted at uh, CCS by Zimbowski, Faust, and Standard, which presents a um, method to protect, uh, the, at least the cryptography part uh, of um, a, an IC against Trojan uh, hardware trojans. 
it relies on multi-party computation techniques. So the idea is that it will not be possible to activate the Trojan. The trigger will not work because of these MPC techniques. But also, uh, we can still get some strong guarantees uh, under reasonable condition that the number of times the device is used is bounded. So we know, for instance, if the circuit has a throughput that is what it is, we know that it will not be used to encrypt uh, you know, the size of the universe uh, in terms of volumes of data. So under such bounds, we can make sure that uh, an adversary will not be able to use a hardware trojan. So even if they manage to put one in the chips, they will not be able to use them. The downside of the approach presented in this paper is that uh, it requires a testing phase. So once you, when you receive your um, circuits, integrated uh, circuits from the manufacturer, you need to do some testing uh, on them. And there is a huge increase in the overall circuit size and on the computational overheads uh, associated to the evaluation of um, the encryption functionality. So our idea is instead to try to find the best way to adapt existing ciphers to this model, we're instead going to design a custom tailor-made cipher which is intended specifically to be used uh, in this context. So some more details about the model that we're considering. What they considered in that paper from 2016 is that there is, um, so the circuit you want to implement, say the AES, later our cipher, and this circuit is trans it's transformed into a set of sub-devices. And the idea is that all these sub-devices, when assembled together by a master circuit, do the same as the initial circuit. So you're kind of splitting the computation into several sub-components, sub-devices. We can ask a single manufacturer, potentially malicious, to produce all these sub-devices. So we do not need to have different manufacturers for the different sub-devices. And that's one of the strengths of this model. We do not need a complicated supply chain. We can just have everything come from the same spot. Once we have received these sub-devices, we test them. And then we need to assemble them using a master circuit in which we have some uh, trust. Of course, um, the idea is that the trusted master circuit is going to be extremely expensive to manufacture because it has to be done basically by you. So it has to be as small as possible to limit the cost. So how do we prevent, how does this model uh, help? We can prevent time bomb triggering by testing the sub-devices. So we can ourselves, when we receive the IC circuits, <coughs> sorry, the integrated circuits decide that we're going to test uh, one of them uh, 900 times and the other 937, etc. So time bombs are not going to work. We can prevent the use of uh, cheat code activation or uh, any of these special keywords by using techniques from secret sharing and multi-party computation. So the idea is that each uh, the input of each sub-devices is going to be scrambled somehow uh, using secret sharing. So each of them is going to receive uh, statistically uh, an input which is statistically independent from the correct one. And then we can avoid leaks by recombining the outputs from each uh, sub-device. And again, it's a trusted master which will do the combination. So we still assume that there is a part of the circuit that we can trust. The game is to make it as small as, as uh, possible. How then do we build a cipher specifically for this? So the idea, uh, the, uh, the, the main bottleneck that we need to overcome is the use of secret sharing. So what we will do is rely only on linear operations, which sounds weird, but bear with me. So one round of encryption will, will consist of two operations, L and M, and the key addition, and both L and M are linear. So we can do uh, secret sharing each time uh, very simply. Of course, if your cipher is linear, you have a bit of a problem. So we are going to have that L and M are linear according to different algebraic structures. So in our case, uh, M will be over binary field and L over um, modular ring. Once we have that, we can have different sub-circuits 
that will each implement a full encryption. So that's what you have in uh, these boxes here with the dots. Each of the boxes is a uh, sub-circuit. And then the, each sub-circuit will have several mini-circuits. So these mini-circuits are done uh, with uh, via outsourcing. So I will ask one of my potentially evil uh, partners to manufacture a bunch of L's and a bunch of M. I'm going to use them to build a first sub-circuit uh, gamma 1, which will implement a full run of the block cipher. And I will also build another sub-circuit gamma 2, which will also implement a full run, etc., etc. And then I will use the majority function to actually get my output from this. So again, L and M are implemented using potentially untrusted chips, but there is a master circuit that handles the secret sharing uh, uh, and the recombination in the end. This simplifies greatly the testing phase from this uh, Zimbowski paper. Um, so in our case, we can test the input-output behavior of the cipher itself and not of each component individually, which is a great simplification. We also reduce the communication complexity by reducing the number of communication rounds between the trusted master and the mini-circuits. And uh, finally, since we rely on linear operation, the um, secret sharing is going to be very easy. And in fact, we can reuse only two shares instead of uh, three in the original paper, which again reduces the hardware cost. Basically, each mini circuit will rely on fewer uh, L and M applied in parallel. Okay, so now how do we do that in practice? And that's MOI. So we have decided to build a 128-bit block cipher where L is going to be a modular multiplication by 3, which we denote A3. M is going to be a multiplication by a big invertible binary matrix, which we derive from a random uh, generator. And then a step consists in uh, the following operations. So first you have a key addition, the inverse of the multiplication by 3, big matrix uh, multiplication, key addition, multiplication by 3, big matrix multiplication. You see that we have an extremely simple key schedule with just some round constants, and we came, claim 127 bits of security as long as the amount of data that is queried is less than 2 to the 64. Why did we choose these uh, two main operations, multiplication by 3 and multiplication by a big main binary matrix? I will let you read the content of the slide, but basically if we want to get an abelian group, we have to use products of, um, I mean the Cartesian products of rings of dimension p to the power ei. And if we want to have an endorphism over such a group, we're going to have uh, basically matrix multiplications. So in our case, we decide to use two extreme cases. Uh, we set p equal to 2. And then we have that the first group we consider is uh, when all the exponents are set to 1, so we only have z over 2z, and it then z over 2z times z over 2z, n times. So then we just get the group of inv invertible matrices uh, over the field uh, f2 to the n. And at the other extreme, we set uh, the case where, well, we don't really have uh, matrix multiplications because we only have 1. Uh, ring, in this instance z over 2 to the nz, and that's the two operations we're going to use. And that's why we use these two operations. But we still need to study these operations, and because we want to have some strong guarantees in terms of security, of course. Using modular multiplication in symmetric ciphers is uh, not uh, our idea. This was already done before, including, in fact, in a cipher called IDEA. Uh, in uh, 1991. And uh, here on this slide, you can see an overview of all the modular multiplications that have been used to the best of our knowledge uh, in the literature. And you can see that there is some um, differences in the modulus in the moduli used. So in IDEA, for instance, it's 2 to the 16 plus 1. But we also have some who did uh, what we did 
which is to uh, have 2 to the n. So you have that in Morse, you have that in Nimbus, in Multiswap, in Shabal also, and in Sosemanuk. Um, it's an operation which is not linear in the field. It has good properties of confusion and diffusion for low cost in software, uh, because one multiplication is going to be one instruction. And it will have, as we will see, a high algebraic degree, which is a good property to have in order to prevent integral and algebraic attacks. Why is that? Why is it that the algebraic degree is high? Let's look at alpha equal to 3, because anyway, it's what we're going to use here in uh, MOI. Uh, multiplication by 3, you can say that it's x plus 2x. And 2x in z over 2 to the nz, it's just a shift. So you get uh, this operation. Then you have that yi is obtained using the XOR of uh, xi, xi minus 1, and the carry. Uh, which we denote mu i. The carry then is given by this induction, so the first two bits are set to zero, and then it's the majority function of uh, the previous two values and the previous carry as well. So this is a quadratic function, and as you can see then, here uh, this bit is a linear in the sense of f2 function of the input, same for this one, this one will be a quadratic function, but then the next one, the carry, will depend also on the previous carry, which is already quadratic, so it will be of degree 3, etc., etc. So overall, the algebraic degree of A3 is equal to n minus 1, which is uh, the maximum for a permutation, actually. And since it's the maximum, uh, the inverse will also have the same degree. I hand-waved the proof here. Uh, we have a proper one uh, in the full paper, if you're interested. Then we turned our uh, sights on the differential properties. So along the way, we have found that if you look at the DDT of multiplication by 3, XOR, the identity, you get Sierpinski triangles, which looks cool and which we were quite surprised by. Uh, again, if you are curious about it, uh, I would urge you to read the paper. In terms of security, what's important is uh, this bound. So it's possible to bound all the coefficients uh, in a given line on the DDT using this formula here. So if you take any coefficient, the coefficient at line A and column B, it's smaller than 2 to the n plus 1 minus C of A. And what is C of A? I hear you ask. It's the number of changes. So it's a notion we have introduced. Uh, it's the quantity defined by this formula where, uh, so basically it's the Hamming weight of this uh, vector C, where C1 of A is the XOR of the first two bits, and Ci is the XOR of the bits i and i minus 1, but it's set to 0 if Ci minus 1 was already set. So concretely, if you have A which is uh, equal to this value, you have as first two bits 0, 1 here, so that's one change, then you still have 1, then you still have 1, then you have a 0, so that's another change. And then you have 0, 1, which would be another change, but since you had a change in the previous um, position, it doesn't count. So for this value of a, ca is equal to 2. So that's the number of changes. What is very nice is that this bound is independent from the output difference b. So if we can say something on the input difference, then we can bound the probability of a differential transition. And that's why we use the inverse of A3 followed by A3, because then this bound from the theorem tells us something in this direction and in this direction. So what we need is uh, an equivalent of the branching number we have for matrices, but for changes. As soon as we have that, we will have some bounds. So that's exactly what we did. We introduced the change branch number, which is the equivalent of the branching number before this uh, number of changes. And we have uh, some theoretical and some uh, experimental arguments to compute the change branch number of a random nonlinear permutation, uh, of first a random nonlinear permutation, and then we also push this analysis further to look at linear uh, permutation. And in particular, we expect that the ran random matrix on 128 bits has a change branch number equal to 24. 
it means that we can reuse the similar style of uh, arguments as we would use for with the regular branch number uh, and the differential uniformity and then we can show that any characteristic covering the uh, three operations uh, a3 minus 1 m a3 will have a probability uh, at most of 2 to the minus 22 meaning that four steps will be safe uh, against an attacker with 2 to the 64 data as for the security analysis for other attacks, uh, there is the simple related uh, key property with probability 1, which explains why we claim 127 bits of security instead of 128. Um, I won't go over the details, but uh, it's a consequence of the key schedule. And for linear attacks, as well also as for differential attacks, though I won't get into it, we have some very strong uh, experimental arguments. So MOI is defined for 128 bits, but its general structure with the big multiplication by 3 and the binary matrix multiplication can be defined for any block size. So what we did is we looked at much smaller uh, versions for uh, 8 bits to 16 bits, and then we plotted what you can see here. So essentially when the quantity that is plotted is under 1, you are safe from linear, linear attacks. Um, you, I would refer you to the paper if you want the details, I really don't have time for them uh, in this uh, video. But what's important is that as you can see, starting from uh, 4 rounds, we are consistently under, uh, at most at 1. And in fact, as n increases, we get much further from 1, meaning that in our case, since n is equal to 128, we are already very safe. These experiments uh, are very strong in the sense that we actually computed the LAT of the cipher. So there is no assumption about uh, linear trails in particular. This is not the probability of a uh, complete tr fully specified trail. It's really linear approximation of the cipher. So it's very strong in that sense. For uh, other attacks, we of course uh, have results, but again, I won't have uh, time to go over them. In conclusion, we have proposed a cipher which is tailor-made to the CCS model uh, to prevent hardware trojans from being exploitable, and it has better performances than existing ones uh, at the time of publication. Along the way, we have made a comprehensive study of the cryptographic properties of modular multiplication by a constant, in particular three, and we even find found some fractals along the way, which is always fun. Uh, but Obviously, this cipher has a very simple structure, which, while it was intended for the specific use case with hardware trojans, could have other applications, which we would be very curious to hear about. And with that, I will conclude uh, this talk. Thank you for your attention.